This conference will now be recorded. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> this is the uh, meeting of the uh, West Basin uh, Engineering uh, Operations Committee and a special meeting of the Board of Directors. And today it's uh, uh, Wednesday, June 9th, and it's four, or just a little past 4 p.m. Um, so uh, <clears throat> getting started with the meeting, First, do we have a quorum? And I see that Director Williams is on. So yes. I've, and there's uh, Director Deer and Director Houston. Um, Director Gray here? Uh, not yet, so, Director Alvarez. She's, she's logging or calling in right now. OK. So we can get going. Um, any public comments? Uh, Chairman Alvarez, there are no public comments. Okay, next presentations. Do we have any presentations today? Likewise, we have none, Chairman. Okay, then the next item is the action calendar, and there's we have no items on the action calendar today. Action calendar, and then there's the information calendar, and we have two items. So, General Manager, the first item up is the water facility operations update. Um, yes. Would you like to Proceed with that presentation. Yes, thank you, Chairman Alvarez, uh, members of the member of the committee and board, public and staff. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, we have our standard monthly update, and we have uh, three co kind of components to present here. Three presenters. Um, part of the operations update uh, report will be a brief recap of the major power outage that we had. Um, a couple of weekends ago, uh, thanks to the, uh, the squirrel who uh, took out our substation. And um, we have uh, Susanna Lee to report on that and some other operational activities. So, uh, Susanna is our senior operating operations engineer. Susanna, could you do the first part and then pass it back to me? Okay, thank you, Patrick. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, good afternoon, Chairman Alvarez and members of the board. Um, as Patrick mentioned, you can find a copy of the memo on page three of the package with all the new recycled water connections update. And the PowerPoint is also attached in the package this month, and it begins on page 12. So as Patrick mentioned, we'll begin with the report on the Legacy Little Power Outage that happened last month. And as you may aware that a plan-wise uh, power outage occurred on Saturday, May 22nd, which took a good part of the day to restore power. So if you turn to page 13, you can find a rough timeline of the events for the day. I won't go into the details of all the um, little items, but in summary, the power outage happened right um, before 9 a.m. on Saturday, May 22nd. Suez and West Basin staff notify um, refineries um, and customers and stakeholder immediately. And the power outage was, as Patrick mentioned, caused by a curious squirrel, which we believe caused an arc and shorted the on-site um, SCE substations at ECL. And just want to emphasize that it was a multi-agencies coordinated event that um, involved SUA staff, SCA staff, and West Basin staff that worked together um, on the repairs and providing the necessary communications and updates to all customers and all the stakeholders throughout the day. And our refineries took into portable water and SCE completed the electrical, necessary electrical repairs by around 5 p.m. that day and brought powers back on around 5.30 p.m. In the end, there were minimal um, interruptions to our disinfected tertiary customers. Um, we would like to give a big thanks to Lorenzo and all the SMS staff for their hard work on that day. Um, a hard shutdown like this takes a lot to really go through um, and thoroughly assess all the impacts and make all the necessary repairs and changes to the operations. So it took a lot of coordinations and to bring the equipment back online when the power was um, um, turned back on. 
So Suez also had to continue to work late into the night and to bring production back um, to get recycled water delivered to customers. So the next few slides are some photos to highlight activities that took place on that day. If we turn to page 14, um, it shows a map overall that shows the electrical, major electrical equipment on site at ECL. Um, if you look on the right hand corner, this is where the power, SDE power lines that comes in and um, provide powers to the plant. The substations are located right here in the south uh, east corner of the plant. And there are two SE structures right at this corner. And these, like I mentioned, these are SCE owned um, assets, and we do not have any access to it, to them. Um, we did learn from SCE rep that these service uh, structures are inspected every five years, and they were last inspected 2017 and 18. But for any reason, if we do notice anything, um, um, not correct, we can put in a uh, work ticket and they will be able to send a um, crew out to, ins um, to repair for any repairs necessary. So on page 15 um, are some photos that shows the damage to the substations. Um, you can see the circle just highlight where the square work was and um, the damages as shown on the um, highlighted squares. These spikes are meant for um, preventing birds landing on the equipment and the circular is, is what we call, or the SE call them squirrel guards, um, even though they were designed to deter squirrels from playing around at the substation. Um, but accidents like this do happen. Um, we do find that it causes about 8% of power outage in the U.S. So unfortunately, um, these um, incidents do happen. So these guards on the right, uh, just when the high voltage uh, SE crew came and start removing the damaged guards and starting to repair. Page 17, uh, uh, 16, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the photos of the electrical repair work that took place on that day. Um, these are the high voltage crew that got on site around noon and they start assessment and repairs. And we're just happy that the SCE um, responded relatively quickly and, and were able to restore power to our facility on the same day. On the next page, 17, are some photos that show other work that operator had to handle on that day. Um, the two photos on the left shows that um, the water in the waste basin were rising. Um, in the initial hours when the operators were trying to determine what, what happened and who, we lost communication to the Hyperion station for a little bit and operator had to, um, divert water um, from the waste basin. Um, on the photos on the left, on the right are photos showing that the disinfected tertiary filters and the pretreatments um, and the filters are back online. And that's one of the uh, first priority that the operators um, were focusing in, um, in the initial hour when the power was back, because we needed to provide um, water to our disinfected tertiary customers. Um, just want to lastly mention uh, one of the final repairs that um, was related to the power outage. Um, that repair was completed yesterday. Um, this was a, a breaker replacement that was necessary to complete to bring uh, our power completely back to the normal power. Um, it, the Chevron trains were on um, temporary backup power until yesterday. It was a large uh, coordinated effort. Um, we, so we just want to give thanks to Suez staff for a well-coordinated job done yesterday. Moving on to page 18. So here we are with the influent water quality for the month of 
May, we had relatively bad water quality, as you can see on the right. Um, the average turbidity for the month was well above our average. Um, it was around 23 NTU for the month. Um, we Last week, we had a very bad water quality upset event. And in talking with Hyperion, um, they were adjusting and optimizing some chemical dosing on their end, and also adjusting and reacting to the now post-COVID water quality. So we've been working um, closely with them and they've been adjusting their operations and we are seeing some improved water quality um, today. So this is just April production. Um, this is still early in the month, so we don't have the May, uh, May production number. So as of April, we're about 3% below budget in terms of sales. Moving on to page 20, these are just some highlights on the maintenance work for the month of May. Uh, we replaced the last uh, two of the RO trains membranes at Torrance. This is the photo on the left. The photo on the in the middle is showing um, the HVAC replacement work at the Hyperion pump station. And then lastly, um, on the right, um, this is showing like you can see the water quality that we just received this last week, um, which caused some um, maintenance work. Um, this is the phase five auto strainer, and it was just clogging all the auto strainer basket. And also we had some damaged um, basket that we had to replace. So some of those work was completed as part of yesterday's um, breaker replacement work. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Uzi to continue our report. Yeah, Susanna, before, before you go to Uzi real quick, um, I really want to thank staff for that response uh, on May 26th and beyond uh, yourself and Uzi and Barkiv who was on site and um, Lorenzo and his team. It's a major deal when you lose power to the entire facility. Uh, there was no non-compliance. All of our customers were kept in water that we could keep in water or switch to potable. Uh, while the repairs were being made, but it was a tremendous uh, team effort. And uh, kudos to all the operations. And uh, I know Cal Water was also involved to help us out with the inspection of the uh, distribution line. So thank you for that. Sorry, Uzi? Great. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Susanna. And good afternoon, directors. Um, I'll continue our presentation here with some of our regular updates related to compliance and water quality. We present this to you each month to show um, the reports that go to our regulators. Um, last month, we went over some of those extensive reports, particularly for the barrier, so you can see that, and um, the amount of samples in addition to no notice of violations. If we did have anything, um, we would report it to the board um, in this format and let you know what the resolution was. Next slide, please, Susanna. This side, uh, slide here, a little bit busy, uh, maybe intentional, because sometimes that's what it feels like um, when you're in the midst of it in compliance and in the laboratory. But I wanted to just give a quick overview of the highlights uh, to demonstrate the level of work that goes in when you operate treatment plants. Again, I like to always say that we're proud at West Basin, and I think sometimes uh, we know on the inner workings uh, what goes on, but on the outside, it might look easy. People think it's a couple reports uh, that have to be put out, um, but many of us are aware that there's a lot more that goes into operating these type of facilities that win many awards because of the level um, of effort folks put into it. When we have our permits, we covered the barrier permit last month, but we have many different permits. And I always say we have eight extensive core permits. Um, we have the barrier permit, we have what we call the Title 22, which is the disinfected tertiary. Those are separate permits. We also have to have the brine permits to accompany those um, at JMM um, or at the Juanita Milan or McDonald Milan or facility. We also have to have a brine permit that goes out to the joint plant. We have stormwater permits. Um, we also have to file reports when we have incidents um, or if we have any spills. Um, 
There are also a lot of sampling that goes into that. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of samples that have to be taken. And a sample plan is not always a simple task. Those can change. The minute we sample um, a constituent, um, we can have an exceedance. That doesn't mean it's a violation, but that might trigger a number of other samples. It might require us to update those schedules. Those schedules have to be done in coordination with our own laboratory, with commercial laboratories, um, with our samplers, and even with third-party groups that we have, for example, at our wells. We have to employ outside help to get our well sampling done because it requires us to haul that water away in addition to taking those samples. Once they arrive in the lab, all of that analysis, again, must be done meeting very strict standards. Um, some in the industry have probably heard about the ELAP controversies going on, some, some very tough standards coming down from the state on how labs have to be run. And while those standards are very commendable, um, there it's also starting to limit the number of labs that can perform certain samples, uh, many of those for advanced water treatment. In recycled water, we have to look for some things at the tiniest, tiniest parts per billion level and it really starts to narrow the field of who we can find out there that is certified to look for those. We then have to have all those approved, the quality control plans, the method validation plans, those all have to kind of be a back and forth effort um, with, with our labs um, and with the regulators to make sure we can get those approved. All of those results then will go into various platforms. Um, we upload them into water tracks. It's a system we have. The labs have the limb systems. Um, and then finally, those are put together with compliance staff into reports. Um, the reporting systems, most of which are now online, but many of the regulators also require a paper hard copy as well. So I think we're still in transition. Um, we we would love the perfect world where there was one uh, platform that all the regulators could use, but of course they can't. So we actually have to, if you look in the last column there, we have to upload all of these different reports onto different formats um, that are from different agencies, state, federal, and even local. All of those have strict deadlines. Probably the majority of violations that a lot of water agencies receive are just for missing a deadline or even missing a sample that was overlooked. Um, and that's why this work is so critical and we like to highlight it. And just as a side note, the board will be seeing most likely in August, um, selection of a new chemistry lab. We're gonna go out to RFB next month. Um, and as I stated earlier, the, the pool of labs available um, is becoming slim, but we are reaching out and we hope to get uh, at least two or three that will um, submit bids. Next slide, please. This again is one of our uh, regular sl slides that we like to present here, just to go over all the work that is done at West Basin, um, work with our customers. Um, I'll give a lot of credit to Frank's group as well. This is probably a program that involves all of operations to make sure that um, our potable water customers are receiving um, the customer service that they deserve. Um, there's a lot of coordination. They are not member agencies. We are, so we have to often be the go-between, help facilitate efforts, coordinate shutdowns, um, work between the different groups. Um, and while they are not uh, fast changing, we like to make sure that the board is aware of these different projects going on. We also have the Title 22 program, and that is a courtesy program we have right now for two enrolled cities, Inglewood and Manhattan Beach. And each month there's usually a little activity related to making sure that their groundwater wells um, are monitored um, and have the correct schedule. Brewer, as we noted before, has been down for some repairs. So you can see the production last month was a bit lower and we're working on those repairs currently now. Next slide, please. I think we'll involve Frank if you would like to take over here, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Uzi. Good afternoon, directors. Um, if you can please refer to page 24 of your board packet. Um, so this slide uh, is just a, our monthly summary of the uh, recycled water uh, distribution system uh, activities that are implemented by California Water Service Company 
which entail uh, our air vacuum valve inspections, leak repairs, uh, water samples, uh, including valves exercised. Um, in addition, uh, underground uh, service alerts that are, that Cal Water responds to. Um, I do want to mention that uh, last in the month of May, we did have uh, one leak on a two-inch uh, service line uh, at Valley and Second Street in Manhattan Beach that serves the uh, Valley Greenbelt. It was a very minor leak. Uh, it was repaired uh, on May 4th. Um, and then also we have some, some photographs here that show some of the air valves uh, that were repaired by Cal Water as well during that month. Uh, moving on to uh, page 25 of your board packet, um, I'll now provide an update of some of the support that we provide for connections to new recycled water customers, as well as the support that we provide to uh, cus uh, existing customers for their modifications. So this is for the Dominguez Channel uh, Bike Path Irrigation Project. Uh, this recycled water site was connected May 25th. Um, they uh, will utilize uh, approximately one acre foot per year of recycled water. Uh, the location is uh, at the Dominguez Channel uh, in Hawthorne uh, by 120th Street in Crenshaw. Uh, and staff has been working with LA County Public Works and a nonprofit organization called Lot Spot to get approval for this irrigation system. And so uh, there is a ribbon cutting ceremony that is anticipated for this project. We don't have a firm date yet. However, our public information depart department will be providing the schedule to the board once a date has been set for that. Now, moving on to uh, page 26 of the board packet. Um, this is for the uh, development of the Nash Street Exchange. Uh, this is next to, next to the Edward C. Little Water Recycling Facility. Uh, it's next to the uh, Raytheon facility. And uh, they're planning to connect their irrigation, their future irrigation system to recycled water. And so, uh, staff is working with uh, the Department of Public Health to inspect the uh, all the, the water lines that are being constructed. Uh, and so these are just some photographs of the uh, um, inspection of some of the water lines that um, staff and, and public health inspected. Okay, moving on to page 27 of the board packet. Uh, in addition, staff is working uh, with the developer to expand a recycled water use uh, for the Torrance Technology Center. Uh, this is located off of Western and 195th Street. This is the uh, the former uh, Toyota North American headquarters in Torrance. And so the developer is constructing uh, some new office buildings that will use recycled water for irrigation of their landscaping. Um, in addition, the developer is going to construct two new irrigation, uh, two new recycled water service from our recycled water distribution system. So they will be implementing the construction in staff. We've been working with them on an agreement uh, to ensure the new services are constructed per West Basin standards. And so we anticipate that uh, this irrigation system will be connected uh, in December of this year. Uh, moving on to page 28 of the board packet, um, over at the uh, LA Stadium development in Inglewood, uh, staff is continuing to provide inspections for several ongoing projects at, at this site. Um, this is for the Hollywood Park retail, what's called the, the phase one. This is on the uh, southwest portion of the site uh, over by uh, uh, on, on, on the side of the prairie. Um, and so these photos show some of the inspections uh, that were recently conducted for the irrigation system, again, with along with the Department of Public Health. And this uh, this specific site is anticipated to be connected in April of next year. And then moving on to the next. Uh, Next uh, slide, uh, this is on page 30 of the board packet. This is an existing uh, recycled water customer, and this is the Eaglewood Park Cemetery. Um, this site, uh, again, has, uh, has been connected for some time to recycled water. They use recycled water for irrigation, but they also have um, some fire hydrants that are connected to the recycled water system. And so uh, this is just an additional fire hydrant that the, that the uh, Cemetery wanted to uh, wanted to include at the site, and so staff worked with the Department of Public Health as well to get approval for this new fire hydrant, and that was implemented on uh, May 20th. Moving on to the next slide is page 30 of your board packet. Uh, additionally, staff have been working at the Manhattan Village Shopping Center uh, at Manhattan Beach. Uh, we've been providing updates to the board of, of this project as well. Um, 
These are some uh, backflow devices that were installed uh, to several of the, the water services that provide, uh, these are for the, the buildings on the south side of the, of the shopping center. Um, so once these backflow devices were installed, that allowed approval by the Department of Public Health to expand the recycled water use to the southern portion. So that uh, the southern portion of the irrigation system for this shopping center was implemented on May 27th. And then moving on to the next slide on page 31. Um, staff has also been working with the uh, Top Golf uh, for the, the Lakes Golf Course uh, remodel uh, in El Segundo. This is adjacent to our, our treatment facility. And uh, so staff has been working again also with the Department of Public Health uh, to conduct all the site inspections and get approval for this new irrigation system uh, will be connected uh, toward the end of the year. So. Uh, that concludes our report, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the board? Okay, um, I've got a question slash request. Could I get a copy of the RFP for the laboratory services when you guys have that ready to go? Yes, we'll send that over to you okay. and the whole board. Um, that's it. If no one else has questions, then we can move on to the next uh, item. And thank you. Thank, thank you, Chairman. I'll, I'll raise, uh, yeah, our second information calendar item today is the capital improvement program update. We have, uh, we're not going to report a portion of all of the projects, but we're going to highlight a couple of them. Um, Wendell Johnson, our manager of engineering, is going to do some introductory remarks, and then we're going to have, uh, Kevin uh, Cullen, our engineer, too, uh, and Joel Blair do a couple of uh, PowerPoint presentations. Uh, Wendell? Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee and the board and the public as well. If you could pay, please turn to page 43 of your packet. Uh, before we get to the actual presentations, I want to provide you with an update on some other projects that are well underway, and we have some uh, public relation elements of these projects. So I want you to hear it here first before uh, you you hear it out in the, in the public. And I want to talk about the Torrance PV uh, pump station. Uh, we are in a, uh, we are working with the city of Torrance uh, to assure that we're able to get the pipeline portion of the project done prior to the, the, the city uh, doing a number of repavement of some streets. I think that it's crucial for the uh, optics of the district that uh, we get the pipeline done before they pave the streets. And so we will be uh, doing a massive public relations outreach along with PI about the project as, as well as we will be separating the projects into two phases where one phase will be the pipeline which will go early, hopefully this fall before the uh, pavement moratorium uh, and 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 then also the pump station, which is taking a little longer. Uh, a couple of this should uh, be a value to the district cost-wise. Uh, generally, we have two different types of constructions here, and the industry refers to it as horizontal construction and vertical construction. And you don't have a contractor generally that does both of them, and so you end up with a large ticket item as a um, subcontractor. With, with a markup. And so the, the district should utilize some uh, savings uh, by uh, breaking this uh, project into two. You won't have that standard 15% uh, markup. In addition to that, uh, because of COVID-19, uh, we are under some extreme uh, price pressures and, uh, and it's related generally to the general uh, contract or vertical construction, lumber prices, concrete prices, Oil prices have uh, risen short, sh sharply, you know, in the in the category of 400, 500, and sometimes 700 uh, percent. However, when it comes to uh, pipeline, uh, we're putting in a PVC pipeline. It hasn't been as inflated as uh, those common building materials. Uh, just uh, moving on to uh, JMM uh, Phase Two, Carson. A, a lot of action going on out there. I am pleased to announce that uh, the general manager, uh, Patrick, signed a conditional uh, notice to proceed letter 
Uh, and this is going to allow the contractor do, to do a number of things. It's going to allow him to uh, submit shop drawings, to get things started fabricated, uh, provide a schedule of value, a preliminary uh, schedule work will be done, baseline schedule will be done. There'll be mobilization uh, like the field trailers, uh, some of the survey type control work will be done, as well as some of the safety uh, training and, and survey, surveying, video surveying of the site condition. Uh, this project also has uh, something that is known as a PLA, which is uh, everyone on the board is well familiar. And it's a, it's a project labor agreement. It will also allow a little bit of time for his subcontractors to reach, uh, to uh, enter into these agreements. We have some specific activities that we're allow that we have called for the contractor to work with the local labor unions to provide some uh, uh, entry level training as well as the use uh, usage uh, use of local labor or people that live within our uh, distribution uh, uh, district or within the district's area. So it's it's spending that dollar twice, bringing it back in, in, into the community. Um, so 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 that's a win win for everyone in that particular case. In a, in, a, in addition to the 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 PLA. Uh, PI will be doing an outreach program because simply we're in the process of permitting some of the attributes of the project, which includes the um, uh, generator, uh, standby generator for reliability, as well as the bio four. And this is a, uh, a uh, permit with AQMD uh, because of both the generator and the open vessel. Uh, and this is uh, requiring the district to do a public outreach to the school system uh, and to the community so everyone is uh, uh, aware of uh, uh, what will be uh, going on at that particular uh, water facility, water plant. Additionally, it has, it's, we, I have um, asked um, our uh, DCS uh, con con consultant to take a look at the controls at um, uh, JMM uh, Carson uh, simply because we're 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 this project, you know, we kind of it was dormant for a while, and we got it out, and we were able to get into a construction phase of the project over the last six months, and it's uh, slightly ahead of where it was going to trail the DCS project. So I want to make sure that uh, what we're doing out there, we don't have to do it again, or uh, for you know proper stewardship, and and which. I know that uh, all the directors are, are 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 for that, so that we don't end up putting in an elaborate type of equipment that is antiquated or out of uh, date uh, with the new control system uh, that we will be moving forward. And uh, uh, lastly, um, next month uh, we're we're getting to a point where we have uh, completed a study of the solids handling, and next month we, we're expecting to report to the board about. Uh, the solids handling and what direction we're going to be recommended. And we will also probably be reporting about the nitrification tanks, uh, both at Carson and at um, both at Chevron and uh, Torrance. Uh, and, and with that, if you have any questions, uh, I'm, I'm ready to answer those for you. And if not, I, I'll introduce the uh, part of my staff that will be uh, continuing this presentation. Any questions from any of the board members? All right. Go ahead and continue, Wendell. You're okay. Doing I would like to introduce uh, Kevin Cullen, Engineer 2, and he's going to give you an update on the uh, cathodic protection uh, project, uh, uh, which is underway uh, throughout our uh, uh, district area. Uh, uh, so, so, Kevin? Ready. Thank you, Wendell. Good afternoon, directors. Um, I'll be providing an update today on our cathodic protection system improvements project. Uh, this project primarily concerns our corrosion protection systems, um, which are equipped on our metallic pipelines within the recycled water distribution system. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see a map of our distribution system. Um, there's many colors going on. Um, but if you can focus in, there are uh, a number of colored pipelines. Those are the pipelines that are included within the project scope of work. 
Uh, there's a few faint uh, purple pipelines. Those are also uh, within the di distribution system, um, but however, because they're plastic pipe, um, they do not need or require um, cathodic protection systems. Um, so you can see it, the, the scope of the project um, really takes up most of the, the district service area um, and impacts all, of, all five divisions. Um, so as mentioned, uh, the project concerns improvements to the recycled water distribution system, cathodic protection system. Uh, the construction uh, phase of the project has a duration of one year. Uh, we kicked it off in February earlier this year, and it will um, still on track for completion uh, in February of next year. Uh, the total construction budget is $7.95 million, um, pretty considerable investment by the district into the uh, distribution system. Um, and as mentioned, uh, the scope of work is, is fairly large and encompasses many work locations. In total, there's 275 of those. Um, work will take place at both existing uh, cathodic protection systems. We'll be improving those and replacing anodes that have reached the end of their useful life, um, as well as 132 new uh, test stations for um, additional protection against corrosion. Um, the total uh, anode replacements, um, there's 252 vertical anode beds that will be installed, um, as well as 81 uh, discontinuous joint repairs. Uh, we, we do need to repair um, some of the joints to provide continuity, electrical continuity uh, across the metallic pipelines. Um, the, the CP systems induce a small charge and that, that charge is what actually protects against corrosion. So uh, electrical continuity is key there. Um, and then in total, um, just a neat, neat fact, um, over 1,600 anodes are planned to be installed. Uh, the district uses magnesium anodes um, for cathodic protection systems. They come in a 48 pound sack, so a grand total of 38 tons of magnesium uh, included as part of this project. Uh, on the left-hand side here is just an, a neat graphic um, to help show what cathodic protection looks like. Um, usually there's two types of cathodic protection systems. Uh, one, an impressed system that many of the uh, refineries use on oil transmission lines. Um, but typically in the water industry, uh, you see uh, galvanic anodes or passive uh, cathodic protection systems, uh, which is what the district uses. So um, basically you, you connect um, the metallic structure that you're looking to protect uh, with a more reactive metal. Um, in our case, we have ductile iron pipelines. So we connect our pipelines to uh, magnesium. Uh, by doing so, um, the magnesium anode um, is sacrificed and is oxidized rather than uh, the pipeline itself. So for the scope of work, uh, there's 12 cities or jurisdictions within the district service area that are impacted. We have Carson, the county of LA, El Segundo, Gardena, Hawthorne, Hermosa Beach, Inglewood, Lawndale, City of Los Angeles, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, and Torrance. Um, so today, um, contractor has mobilized. Um, they've been out in the field. They've been um, submitting all of their permit applications to the respective cities uh, looking for approvals. So we have secured permits uh, thus far for Gardena, Hawthorne, Lawndale, Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach, and Torrance. Um, the contractor has also submitted on all of the construction materials that have been approved, um, as well as has started um, some of the discontinuous joint repairs. So thus far, all the work has taken place in Hawthorne. Um, that's where the, uh, the contractor chose to start their work. Um, and actually to date, we've completed seven discontinuous joint repairs and about 10 of the anode installations. And looking forward, uh, we'll look to secure um, the remaining permits. Uh, most of the cities have provided comments on our permit packages, uh, mainly to deal with traffic control and uh, mitigate any impacts to the public. So uh, the ones we're looking to receive uh, approval from still are the County of LA, uh, City of LA, Carson, Inglewood, El Segundo, and Manhattan Beach. Um, and once we get those approvals, we'll just continue to, you know, install the, the anodes. There's many locations for work to be done at, um, continue the discontinuous joint repairs. And then once um, we get a few, a few more anode installations installed on a per pipeline basis, uh, we'll activate uh, each system independently. I did want to just share a few uh, neat, neat photos, uh, construction update photos. Um, you can see what, what these anodes look like. Um, typically, there are anywhere from four to eight anodes installed at one CP test station uh, based on the level of protection required. 
So you can see they come in a, basically a burlap sack with a filled engineered material. Um, they are typically installed in a vertical shaft. So we use a, a drill rig to auger out um, a shaft to install the anodes, uh, helps keep the footprint um, of the installation low. Um, and, it, and then on the right hand side, might seem a little strange here. Um, he's actually watering the anodes as they go in. Um, it helps to activate them and help uh, put out that, that small current um, that they induced on the pipeline. Um, we'll start on the left-hand side here. You can see that the contractor is actually um, installing some anodes beneath the sidewalk. Um, this is out in, again, Hawthorne on 120th Street near the airport. Um, specifically in this location, um, we actually encountered uh, a unique underground utility. Um, beneath uh, the street here is actually the boring tunnel, uh, Elon Musk's boring tunnel. Um, so unfortunately, we were not able to do uh, vertical um, installations. However, uh, we worked with the city and the contractor and um, at no cost to the district, we were able to install anodes at, at just these specific locations. I believe there's six of them horizontally. Um, beneath the sidewalk and you can see uh, just a temporary repair um, when the day is wrapped up uh, the site's left in safe condition uh, this is just temporary asphalt and the sidewalk will be replaced um, I believe next week uh, from joint to joint with a brand new sidewalk and with that I'd like to just pause here and see if there are any questions before I pass it off to Mr. Joel Blair any questions there are none, so keep going. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon, Chair Alvarez, President Williams, and directors. This will be a construction update on filter number two of the Title 22 filter system at the Edward C. Little water recycling facility. Um, for some background on this filter system, please turn to page 15 of your agenda packet. On page 50, we can see an aerial photo of the Ed C. Little facility with the Title 22 filter system highlighted here in the middle. Um, in the middle of the page, the very middle, we can see filters one through six, um, very small font, I apologize, uh, built in 1995 during phase one. Uh, and below that, we have filters seven through 10. Those were um, added in 1997 during uh, phase two expansion. And at the very top of the, of the aerial photo here, we have filters 11 through 14. These were converted in 2007 during phase four um, expansion of the facility. Before, before 2007, these were part of the barrier water system, but now they are part of the Title 22 um, filter system. Along with the uh, high rate clarifiers and the chlorine contact basins, <clears throat> This filter system is one of the key components of the Title 22 water treatment at the facility. At the facility. So a critical part of the operation. Uh, they're relatively simple gravity filters. They're 22 by 22 concrete structures above ground. They're um, filled with about four feet each of anthracite coal. The water flows from the top down to filter. Um, the more complicated aspect of these filters is that Beneath the anthracite, beneath the filtration media, we have a backwash system, <clears throat> and the backwash system bubbles air through the through the basin. This is during backwash to clean um, each filter. <clears throat> this underdrain system is the main reason for um, the rehab work that we are doing today. On the uh, right hand side of this photo, oh, still previous page, please. Thanks. Um, on the right hand side of this photo, uh, we can see the status of the rehab for each of these filters. <clears throat> select filters. Uh, at the bottom, we can see that filters eight and nine were repaired in 2019. Um, They're repaired for media loss. Basically, we were losing anthracite to um, the, the drains and the backwash system. Um, filter two above it, that's the subject of today's update. Um, that's what we're working on today. We also have media loss in uh, filter number two. And um, filters 11 and 13 at the top here, those are also offline, and those are offline mainly for a failed air scour manifold. Um, that means the air distribution system for cleaning, backwashing these filters is currently um, failed and needs to be repaired. If you can please turn to page uh, 51, we'll look at uh, the current work on filter two. So on the left here, we have um, another view of these filters. 
you can see number six here. Um, that's in regular operation mode. You can see it full of water. Number two is the one that's offline in the top right corner. Um, you can see that it's empty and offline. The middle photo here is looking straight down from the top into filter two after most of the media bed has been removed. The anthracite coal has been removed. We can see these um, straight structures. These We call these um, under drain laterals. They're part of the under drain um, clean, cleaning system. Um, they're basically channels to um, push air throughout the whole bottom of the filter to backwash the media. Um, on the right here, we can see um, a perspective view of these, of these laterals. Um, they're trapezoidal in shape, they're hollow. Um, they carry air inside them. They have a screen on the side. The screen is slotted to allow air to come out of them, but it's not supposed to allow the anthracite coal to go inside the uh, underdrain laterals. And on the very right bottom, we can see where the air comes into these laterals. Um, and on page 52, <coughs> Of the packet, uh, we can see some of the work that we're doing on filter two under drain laterals. <clears throat> on the photo on the left, actually both photos, we can see that the slotted uh, screen system has been removed um, for cleaning and for reseeding. And also we are drilling the ends of these laterals. Um, you can see on the photo on the right that the media has infiltrated the channels under, infiltrated the laterals. And so we've we're adding these ports on the end so that for future maintenance activities, we can just blow out the media that's gone inside if it happens again uh, via these ports. And moving on to page 53. <clears throat> so on page 53, this is the end product after the uh, contractor has repaired the under drains. We have this new port um, on the end that can be opened up to let any media come out. And on the right, we have a uh, photo of the 21 laterals on a truck bed ready to be installed back into filter number two. Um, these under drains today are actually um, being installed today. And we expect to test them as early as this Friday and to complete this project by the end of the month. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Kevin and I would be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Any questions? I don't think we have any questions. Great job. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Is that it for the uh, yes. information calendar? That's correct, Chairman. That's it for the uh, information calendar. Okay, so we have a closed session item, and on the closed session, we dial in it's, uh, via the phone. Yeah. yeah, and you should have the number. If you don't, we'll text it over to you. Uh, but if you could log off of this meeting, and as soon as we're done with closed session, we can log back in for a report out after closed session. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Does everybody have uh, the directors have the uh, call in number? I I have it. Does everybody else have it? Yeah, I think you got it. Okay, yeah. we'll, we'll, I'll get the call started. Anybody here? Okay. Any the, the board is in closed session right now.
Hello. Anybody here? Not yeah. Here. Okay. Oh, who is I? Don Deere. Hey, Don. It's you and Hi. me. Arizona. The world's under, in good hands. When the rest of them join, then they show us to hell in a bread basket. Hi, Director Deere and Director Alvarez. Um, the call in number, it's the separate call in number that was sent. This is still the oh. same go to meeting for the Engineering and Operations Committee. I will resend it oh. to you in just a second. It'll be at the top of your inbo inbox in the next minute. Okay, thank you.
I'm back. All right, we're waiting for Director Houston and Director Gray, I think. That's correct. Well, maybe they forgot that they had to rejoin the meeting. Do we have, uh, Steve, you can report out, right? So we're just back to report out, right? Uh, yeah, but yeah. because Patrick's not at the meeting yet either. Oh, there he is. I see him. Oh, there he is. Patrick, right there. <laughs> well, we had the we have the committee and we have a quorum of the board. So right. if it's the chair's pleasure, uh, I could report I out. I think Director yeah. Houston just joined us. So yes, all right, Steve, go ahead and report out from closed session. Thank you, Director Alvarez. The board met in closed session as described in item 7A, uh, conference with real property negotiations on the government code section 5496.8, um, uh, the Brewer de Salter. Uh, a report was given to the board. Uh, no formal action was taken by the board. That concludes my closed session report. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, having finished closed session, the next item up is director comments and future agenda items. So um, we'll start with you, Director Williams. Do you have any uh, director's comments or items for future agenda that you would like to discuss at this time? No, thank you. I just look forward to tomorrow's meeting. Can we report out here? Um, Director Deer, go ahead. Director Deer, we were on uh, director's comments if you have any. Can you hear us? I think he lost. I think we lost. Director Deer, do you have any comments? Director's comments? Chairman Desi, I've got to go to another meeting, so I'm going to leave yeah. now. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Can you do without me? No, but we'll try. <laughs> All right. Director Houston, do you have any comments? No, I have no comments. Thank you very much. Good meeting, uh, Director Alvarez. Thank you. And Director Gray hasn't joined us yet. Um, all right. Uh, I uh, briefly just uh, want to report that uh, on the ad hoc committees, uh, at least the two that I'm serving on, one has to do with the uh, uh, LA uh, agreements uh, and that uh, we've had uh, one meeting and there's another meeting upcoming on that and that's moving along. Um, and it's just uh, one of those things that will e e slowly evolve and we hope to make some progress, but there's not much more to report right now on that. The second item is the Brewer de Salter uh, <coughs> committee. Uh, and that ad hoc committee has been meeting on a regular basis um, and we're moving forward with the uh, <coughs> termination of that asset and are exploring various possibilities. Um, and that's about it in terms of uh, general comments. Um, I will, I don't have any right now, but I'll probably have a, a couple of comments for the uh, agenda for next month. Uh, with that, if there's nothing else, then we're, uh, this meeting is adjourned and it is 6.02 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>